Hello, hello, and welcome to Grad Chat by PhD Balance, where we talk about topics of grad school beyond academic research and that may be a bit more difficult to talk about in our day to day. I'm your host, Linda, and I'm currently finishing up my master's in food science in Ireland. And for PhD Balance, I'm the Grad Chat lead and Twitter coordinator. Don't forget to subscribe to Grad Chat on your chosen platform to get notifications about new episodes. And if you feel like it, maybe leave us a rating or review. Our topic today is finding community online in grad school, and I'm so excited to welcome our guest, Jennifer Van Alstein. Jennifer is a communication strategist for professors and researchers at the Academic Designer LLC. Jennifer helps people share their work effectively online. The Social Academic blog has articles and interviews on managing your, work, your online presence. Jennifer is a Peruvian American poet with a BA in English and an MFA in writing and poetics and an MA, oh my God, so many degrees <laughs> and an MA in English. So make sure you connect with her on Twitter and LinkedIn. Wow, you are so, so highly qualified. Welcome, Jennifer. How are you? <laughs> oh, I'm doing so well. I'm excited that you, you said all of my degrees because we're going to be talking about grad school today. And I think that um, my business and everything that I, I do now for helping professors and researchers talk about themselves online, it all started when I needed to find community because I felt isolated when I was in grad school. Um, so I'm excited to talk with you about that today. Um, let's see, I got my MFA uh, and then I went on to get a master's in literature. And both of those programs, I actually networked a little bit differently online. So I'm excited to share some of my tips and tricks, things that worked for me. Um, and I just want to start off by telling you a little bit about my background. So um, both of my parents actually passed away before I went to college. So I think I felt more isolated than a lot of my friends in terms of my support system. Um, when I was starting college, I was actually in an abusive relationship and that made it really difficult because it had limited all of my friendships from high school and most of my family relationships that had really isolated me within this relationship. Leaving that was so hard, but it was the right thing for me to do. And stepping away from that, I just got to be honest and say that it didn't necessarily mean stepping away from the fear of that. Um, I continued to have difficulty sleeping, difficulty um, just kind of like with everyday, everyday things while I was in college. Um, and when I was in grad school, I moved like halfway across the country. And that was that kind of distance was a big change for me. For me, it felt like I could finally sleep, um, that I was resting more, and that I was able to think more creatively. Um, that was really helpful because I was in a poetry writing program um, in Boulder, Colorado. Um, so I definitely experienced some culture shock when I moved uh, from the Jersey Shore to Boulder, Colorado. Um, there was a lot of vegan restaurants and um, lots of organic food. And actually my campus had beautiful orange trees that you could just take fruit on campus. Um, these things were all uh, things I found attractive and I felt like I might connect with more once I moved there. Um, and then once I was there, it was also a little bit unusual for me. I was feeling like I was in a different space. I was also feeling different emotionally. I was meeting all sorts of new people, which was great, but also it was overwhelming. I mean, after I had, had that difficult time with all of my friendships and, you know, family relationships, those friendships that I made in college meant a lot to me, which meant when I was in grad school, halfway across the country, I really wanted to be able to talk with those people still. Um, it was really nice to be able to send them messages, to talk on the phone, um, and to even talk on like Facebook video chat. I think this was um, kind of pre-Zoom or Zoom may have, may have just been coming around, but it wasn't there yet. Um, so I had been using online sources to connect with people and really sustain those relationships that I felt were important to me. Um, when I was in my MFA program, a lot of people in my program were connecting with poets and visiting writers who were coming to the school. And I always had a lot of anxiety about connecting with people on social media, um, but that was kind of the first time in which um, I kind of reached out to people I didn't know before. And for a lot of people who are in grad school, maybe they've never reached out to someone they didn't know before. Um, that's pretty normal, actually. Um, so me reaching out to someone even before they came to visit in hopes that we might have something to connect with and talk about at their visit um, was a total change for me. And 
I never really expected people to accept that connection request because I, I don't know that I would have at the time uh, because of that fear again that I had, uh, but they did. And people were more open and friendly and uh, warm than I expected. Some people would even show up at an event um, ready to read their book and they'd say, oh, I recognize you from Facebook. Um, and they know a little bit about you already. Um, so that kind of connection is really what, what started my whole thinking about how community can be found online and how you can really cultivate it for yourself. Wow, that, um, well, firstly, I'm so sorry that you were in that kind of a relationship that is really terrible, but really great that you were able to get out of it and that you have learned, I'm not going to say learned from it, but moved on so much and got into a good place. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would say that there are things that I've learned from. I've learned definitely about myself. I've learned what's important to me and what I need in life and um, that it's important for me to keep the people that I meet close. That's very good. I think you gave an excellent tip when you were talking and that is reach out to people even when you're scared to um, because that can be terrifying when you start. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it's so scary. Um, and I think that that my feeling about that fear, it, it didn't really go away. I mean, I've done it more and I've had great responses a lot of the time, but the fear of actually sending the message the first time, it doesn't really go away. So practicing it, starting out when you're in grad school, practicing like, oh, let me say hi, let me introduce myself. Um, it feels unusual. It's going to feel awkward, but it can have amazing payoff. That's really great. I think that that's such great advice for people. And um, I guess one of the most important things to talk about is, um, you, you talked about a lot of topics there, but um, I guess starting with where to start. Yeah, where to start, going, that's-, that's it's, a it's a big, question. it's a big question. <laughs> It is a big question, but you know, it's the one that I'm most used to answering because this is how all professors and researchers and even PhD students who are working with me, they, they all have somewhere that they start. For me, where I wanted to start was I really wanted to work with more faculty who were coming to visit. And there was a position open, a graduate uh, assistantship um, that was essentially being a faculty liaison to visiting, visiting professors and people who were going to be doing um, talks and special workshops and things. And I really wanted to do that kind of job. I had done event work when I was in college. Um, and so this seemed really right up my alley. Um, I also knew that it was a competitive position because there was only one. <laughs> <laughs> and I really wanted it. So I felt that knowing more people in the community was going to be helpful for me. Um, I felt like the writing community moves really fast. And I think that people in other fields feel the need to keep up with research and with publications that are happening in their field that are important. The poetry world is kind of the same. People are publishing books all the time. There's, I mean, hundreds, thousands of books that come out per year um, through this kind of small poetry community. And that means <laughs> it's important to know what people are up to. It's important to know um, what they're working on, what they're passionate about. Um, and so networking with those people was about me a little bit. It was about me wanting to know more about what's going on in that community, but it was also about them. I wanted to be able to see what work they were putting out into the world and how they were cultivating community themselves. That's really important. And that's such a good opportunity to have had and it's amazing. Um, I know very little about the poetry world, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> um, I'm over here in science, just <laughs> in my little science, bubble. Right? Yeah, in so my cool. little bubble. <laughs> but um, what advice, I guess, what, first, I have many questions, but the first question I'm going to go with is, what is the easiest quote unquote social media or communication method to start with if people want to start right now um 
So the easiest thing that you can do to connect with someone online is to hit the follow button or the connection request on like Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, so this is a really simple act of reaching out and saying, hey, I'd like to be connected with you in some way. I'd like to see what you're sharing. Um, it's not necessarily a two-way street at that point. That person would then have to accept the request for you to be more connected. Um, that's totally okay. Some people are not going to accept the request, but if you don't start Start by reaching out, um, they're unlikely to say find you and reach out to you um, if you're not in their circle already. Um, so this is a really good opportunity to reach out to someone with kind of um, low stakes, like sending a connection request. You don't have to write a personal note. You don't have to write anything that's asking them for anything. So you're not actually asking too much from them. You're saying, hey, check me out. And if you don't want to accept me, that's okay. And do you have any advice? I, you said that you had, um, you know, you were reaching out to these people who were coming, but do you have any advice for, say, grad students who are trying to reach out to professors that they admire their work or something like that, and they don't have any um, intro? Do Should they just send this connection request or should they just be like, I read your paper and I really, really liked it. Um, would you like to connect? <laughs> Oh, that's a great question. So actually both work, both work fine. Uh, but if you send the more personalized request and that is coming from a place of genuine af affection for their work, like you've read their work and you like it and you have something specific to say about why you liked it, that is an excellent note to send. Now, the reason I say both are really good is because for a lot of people, you might have someone you admire that you don't necessarily have that specific thing you, you wanna say. So don't feel like you have to do it every time but when you do feel that way, you should definitely send that message. I've never heard any professor say that getting a message like that hasn't been um, something that's made them smile. So that, that'd be great. And you may send that message and they still don't accept their request, but I don't want you to feel bad about either because the note that you sent might still have had an impact on them. I think that is, is, is great advice. You're just full, you're just full of great advice and we're only a few minutes in. Um, <laughs> so why don't we talk a bit more about the work that you do with professors and exactly how you help them? Sure. So professors and researchers do amazing work. I mean, they're publishing, teaching, doing service, doing community work. Um, oftentimes, not a lot of people have opportunity to hear about the work, especially all those different types of work that they do. If you're an amazing at publications and citations, you have a, a high index for that. Well, that's great. People are going to be reading all about that because that's already online, but they might not understand that as a teacher, you're doing amazing work too, or that the service project you're working on is having massive impact within your community. Having an online presence isn't just about sharing publications, although that is probably the biggest factor in why professors start. It's also about finding that community online, not just for your interests or your research, but actually for yourself so that you have a network of people you can connect with about different things, about the things that make sense for you. Uh, there is lots of ways to start managing your online presence, but for professors and researchers, having a website or a LinkedIn profile or a social media presence can be really impactful for them. Um, now, I think that the biggest caveat to that is that all of those aren't right for everyone. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you go out and build a million profiles and a website and manage all of it. You're probably really busy. I know that I was in grad school and for a lot of professors, they're really busy too. And so sometimes that's why they hire me. Um, but the truth is that everyone, doesn't matter where you're at in your research career, everyone has that fear and anxiety about putting themselves out there online. <laughs> It's normal. And so I like to be honest about that because if you're hearing a senior senior scientist is having anxiety about having their bio online, then you should understand that as a grad student, that anxiety is totally normal. It's totally okay. But pushing through it can totally help you reach the people that care about you. Um, so that's why I suggest it for graduate students. I think that's that's really great um like you said it can be hard what because there's so many um social medias out there and yeah. do do you have any advice on how to figure out which one is right for you um so I have a good blog post that goes through all the social media platforms um it gives you a good option for 
each. But the truth is that most people shouldn't be on a lot of social media platforms. Most people should be on like one or two um, and then maybe have like a Google Scholar profile if they've started publishing. Um, I think that people spread themselves too thin, but the two that are most important, I would say for academics, the ones that most academics are on and are using right now, or Twitter, which we've talked about a little bit, and LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn isn't just for jobs. It's great for networking. So um, I definitely wanted to bring that up. But if you're like, I love Instagram and that's where I want to be spending my time, that's totally okay. I would recommend maybe having a LinkedIn profile or a personal website at the same time, but you can be on whatever social media platform you want. As long as you're communicating the things that you want to online, that's part of managing your online presence. I think that is really good advice. I must admit that I am not a great user of LinkedIn. I have one, but I kind of just let it wallow there. I must admit. Well, you're right in there with most people. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what most people do. Um, with LinkedIn, the thing I like most about it, and I'll share this with all of you grad students who are listening. The thing I like most about LinkedIn is it makes it really easy to do that kind of passive connecting that I was talking about. Um, so when you have a filled out profile, when people can come to your profile and learn about you, that makes it really easy to send that connection request. Um, if you see someone in your field or another researcher, maybe in, in, even in another country, but who's also kind of doing research similar to yours, you can just send that connection request. Maybe they're not on LinkedIn. They're not going to check it right away. But when they do, they can click on your profile and see all about you. <laughs> the nice thing is LinkedIn makes it easy for people to know if they should connect with you or not. They can make that decision much more easily for themselves than visiting, say, your Facebook profile or your Twitter profile, even an Instagram profile, because LinkedIn gives way more information. The other thing I love about LinkedIn is that it's Google searchable. So if someone is searching for something related to your, your study, related to your research on Google, if possible, your profile can show up. And it's a great replacement for a personal website because of that, because your name is going to show up and it's going to lead them to your LinkedIn profile. That's really cool. I didn't really know about that Google searching, but yeah. um, that's amazing. Um, and I think... LinkedIn is definitely something I should use more. Um, <laughs> but um, I guess one of the questions that we do get a lot is how, wh when we're talking about Twitter, a lot of people talk about growing their presence and that is not necessarily the most important thing. Mm. Yeah, let's um, talk about that. What is, I guess, your opinion on that? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. It's actually an educational kind of experience I have to have with a lot of my clients. A lot of people want a big audience online. Um, so let's talk about why people want that and why it's not as important as you might think. So most people feel that if you have a big audience on Twitter, that you'll be able to reach a lot more people. And the more popular you become in terms of followers, the more likely people are to engage with things that you share. They're more likely to retweet you or to like your tweet. All of those things, all of those actions that make people feel good about the posts that they share, that's what you think you're going to get when you have lots of followers. Um, for professors, for researchers, they're hoping that if they have lots of followers and they tweet about a paper that they have, lots of people will then retweet it. But what do those followers mean to you? Uh, for a lot of people who cultivate a big following, they're not really sure who they want to reach. And that's a pretty big problem because if you're not sure who you want to reach, you may get 2,000 followers who are not in your field that like maybe the cat photos you share but aren't interested in your research. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but the expectation that people have of higher engagement levels with higher follower counts doesn't actually add out what will end up happening is that the less interested your followers are with the content that you share, the less they'll actually be shown that content. Um, so they're gonna be even less likely to interact with you the bigger your audience is. So actually the most, the best audiences on Twitter, especially for academics are small, oh, sorry, small but engaged audiences. Um, so you could have 250 followers um, who are mostly in your field and those people are going to share your work. Your tweet that 
is only going to reach the 250 followers initially might actually reach thousands of people because the original people want to share it. They care about you. They care about your research. And that makes a difference. So really think about who you want to connect with more than how many people you want to connect with. I actually stopped trying to add more people to my follower count. I stopped trying to reach more people about six months ago. And you know what happened? I got to pay more attention to the people who are already following me. And I got to engage in more conversations. I got to care more about people. That made a difference for me. And that's why I really recommend you thinking less about how many followers you have and starting to think more about who those followers are. I think that is is really great advice, um, always. And um, I guess it leads to a similar but different question of mm -hmm. what this this may be a bit of a tangent but what is your opinion on having different accounts for professional and personal um purposes no, that's, a, that's a great question actually that that is a frequently asked question for myself so I'd love to answer it um it's a lot of work <laughs> that it's just it's just more work than most people want to do to have multiple accounts when you have multiple accounts, you might be managing the same amount of people, right? Because all of those people are still connected with you, but you're reaching different audiences. You're sharing different content with them. Sometimes people will then share more. They'll like get really into Twitter and be like, I'm going to cultivate both of these audiences. I'm going to work really hard at it. And they get burned out pretty fast. And then they don't really care about either of their groups of followers as much as I think they intended to. Um, so I'm not saying that you have to like put all of your energy into Twitter once you have it, but when you're cultivating those really two different accounts, it just becomes overwhelming for people. So I'd really recommend having one account if you can. Um, I know some people have anxiety about sharing professional news with their personal audience. And some people have anxiety about sharing personal news with their professional audience. But most people I've seen who've done this, who've really cultivated sharing both, um, have found a really amazing response. People are like, oh yeah, they, they're loving my knitting, my knitting photos, and also sharing my computational research study. I, there are so many possibilities for how people connect with you that the more you share, it really gives them more opportunities to connect. So it really then becomes about comfort level. How much personal are you able to share? How much professional are you able to share? That's going to change over time. So just think about evaluating it for yourself every once in a while. Um, try sharing a few more personal posts if you're thinking you might be comfortable with it and see how it goes. You don't have to make a hard and fast decision about this, but I would really recommend not having two accounts if you can help it. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I am, well, I'm completely here for whatever people want to do. If you really want to have two accounts, go for it but I very much do not have separate accounts. I could not handle it. I yeah. find sometimes my own account is too much for me, um, but I do keep certain social medias private. For example, my Twitter is very much personal and professional. I do put everything on it, mm -hmm. but my Instagram is very personal. So that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way for people to break it up for themselves. Um, when I'm saying don't have like two accounts that are one's personal, one's professional, I mean like don't have two Twitter accounts yes. that are one of each, but it's totally normal for people to have um, maybe a private Instagram or a private Facebook and then have a more public facing LinkedIn or Twitter account. Thinking about what's right for you is what matters most. Um, don't, don't think about what's working for other people because that's not necessarily going to be right for you if you're listening. That's very good advice. Um, and I guess one thing about it is when you create this social media presence, you have to manage it. And that is something we've been talking about with all of the burnout and everything like this. Um, but do you have any advice for people avoiding burnout other than don't take on too much? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's easy to say for me to say, you know, don't take on too much. Um, but I do this full time. And so I am going to probably have the appearance of being on social media more than a typical grad student. Now, that's not always true. Some grad students are really prolific at posting on social media. But when I'm thinking about is the amount of time that we dedicate to it. 
for myself, um, when I was in grad school, I felt like I was on social media a little bit too much. Um, and I think that for a lot of people, they're always trying to figure out that balance, like what is the right amount for me? Um, so that struggle and that kind of feeling is probably what's going to best guide you in your decision for how you're managing your account. For some people, managing their Twitter account means posting once a month. It's not very much. And I would still recommend having one if you're going to do that, because having that profile and that online presence with a little bio or something that can direct people to email you or to connect with you in some other way can be super helpful. And it's okay for that person to only post once a month because that's all they have time for. That's all they can do. For some other people, maybe you're going to be posting more um, and more frequent posts can help you reach more people. It can also lead to a little bit of that burnout. So it's really important to ask yourself, even every few months, like, how am I doing with social media? Is my time on social media being utilized well? Is it being wasted more than I want it to be? Maybe I need a break from social media. All of these things are okay, but we tend to avoid thinking about them when we're using it. Um, when people reach that point of overwhelm is when people start to think about it. So if you're listening to this, just try and get into the practice of asking yourself these questions and being introspective more than you're comfortable with and more than you're used to. Awesome. I think that's, that's really, really good advice. I have yes. one more. I have one more thing. Okay. So the thing that I really recommend for people, for like all academics, if you can, is using a social media scheduling tool like Buffer. Buffer is free. It's easy to learn how to use. And it really frees up your need for being on a social media platform to start writing for it. And here's a really good example of when this might be useful. If you're a graduate student who's presenting at a virtual conference or even an in-person conference in the future, it's really helpful to share your talk before it happens, while it's happening, and even after it's happened for people at the conference. It's a great way to get people to attend, but also to share the information for people who maybe can't be there who'd love to talk with you about that topic. When you want to post about your conference on Twitter, most people send one tweet. <laughs> I'm going to be like presenting today at this conference in this room and use the conference hashtag. But if you have scheduling, if you have something that's going to help you write more tweets about the same topic and schedule them out over time, it can be really helpful. So a week before the conference, you can let people know you're working on your presentation, really excited to present. And then a few days before your conference, you can say that you're ready to present and you're gonna be in this room and you hope people add it to their program schedule. Um, and then the day before the event, you can tell people how excited you are and what your topic's gonna be about. These are all opportunities to essentially invite people to your talk or to invite people to talk with you about that topic. And I think that this can help graduate students really feel like their work is reaching more people than just those who are in the room at the time. When people know what you're working on can make a huge difference. I remember that I, I did a talk about a, a topic that I thought was a little obscure. And someone who I knew on Facebook was like, I was so excited about this. I shared this with my class and I had no idea that um, they were even taking a class about the same topic or anything like it. Um, I hadn't spoken them with them since college, but that kind of excitement and reaction made me realize that there are so many people who can connect with our work that we're not necessarily thinking of and being able to post about it online can allow them to feel that connection and to talk with you about it. That's great. <laughs> that's really awesome to have. And I think that's great advice. Um, we often think of um, schedulers more for the professional side of right. um, social media. We use it a PhD balance to help us out, um, but we don't often think about it for ourselves. <laughs> that's right. And it's a great tool to be able to post about things over time. If you have a conference, if you win an award, if you get a publication, if you're working on a service project that matters a lot to you, all of these are things you probably want to tweet about or post on Facebook about more than once. Um, and so scheduling can be really helpful for that. That's, that's really awesome. And um, I guess one thing we haven't really talked about is ma kind of managing your people. 
Mm. And in that set, in that sense of if you want to make sure that you are staying in touch with people, if you want to make sure you're staying in touch with um, the people that are engaging with your content and making sure that you are also engaging with them. And do you have any advice for making sure you stay on top of that? Because that can be in, in itself quite a task. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that kind of relationship building um, can feel a little unnatural, um, especially when it's online. And so trying to think about ways to engage um, really organically and to engage in ways that help you both grow can be best. Um, So I think that some people suggest, you know, reaching out and trying to communicate more and building relationships face to face. But um, the thing that I feel connected with people by is like learning about their cats, learning about their children, um, hearing about what their fears are or what is really important to them or what TV show that they're watching. So I noticed that I I tend to connect with people over these kind of personal things a lot more um, than over their research, because oftentimes their research might be unfamiliar to me or might be in a subject field that's totally different from mine. Um, That doesn't mean that I can't connect with them over that. It just means that the more natural response for me is to gush over how cute their cat photo is um, and to let them know that I know their cat's name (laughs) and that I also have a cat. Um, So sharing a little bit about yourself in an interaction can be really helpful with that too. Um, And I see a lot of people online who are prolific networkers who say how important those personal connections are. Um, So even though you can totally reach out to someone and connect with them over their research, I would also encourage you to reach out over personal things, reach out over something that you found interesting that they shared, or um, actually respond in a comment that shows that you read their post, um, why, you know, why you're responding. Uh, I think that these kinds of interactions can be even better better relationship builders than trying to like schedule a call with someone every couple of months or, um, you know, email back and forth about something really specific, unless it's a collaboration or unless you are working on something together. um, Those other approaches um, might be actually a little bit less helpful long-term. So I think that with relationship building, don't always feel like, you know, you're hoping to get something out of them. Sometimes it's just hoping to know them a little bit better. And that knowledge can turn into something a few years down the line. Um, It can turn into something by them recommending you to someone they know, or just being aware of something that you didn't know that now now that you guys are more connected, they can share with you. Um, So all of these potentials come from just engaging with them as a person and a human being, um, as opposed to a networking connection. Absolutely. I um, I really dislike when people give the advice that you need to connect with people to get something out of them because I have heard people give it before and I'm kind of like I just would like to get to know this person they might be a very nice person (laughs) yeah and I think that there's lots of people who are happy to get to know lots of other people because they're nice people or because they're doing interesting work um, that would maybe be less likely to want to have that connection if they assumed you wanted something from them yeah yeah Definitely. Um, I guess we're coming towards the end. We have still have a little bit of time. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about before we finish up? Mm, let's see. When I was in my second graduate school program, it was more literary focused. Um, and I, I felt that my online community use was quite different from during my MFA. Um, during my MFA, I wanted to network and connect with all of those writers. But when I got into my MA program and I was publishing more criticism, um, I really felt that it was important for me to understand more about my next steps. Did I want to go on to a PhD? Did I want to go into some other kind of certificate or graduate training program? Did I want to go get a job? Um, What I ended up with was starting my own business, but I didn't decide that like right away. I didn't know that was going to be what I wanted. Um, Finding community online to help me understand where I fit into the academic world, what the future might look like for me, those decisions were based on online communities and online conversations. So when I read um, Dr. Karen Kelsky's The Professor is In book, um, I joined her Facebook page and seeing all of the stories that people were sharing there um, was really inspiring to me, not just because of their perseverance or their struggle or um, what was making a difference for them in their academic lives, but because 
it was like drawing back the curtain. It was like all of the things that maybe your supervisor or, you know, the professors in your department are a little bit scared to tell you because they don't, they don't, they don't necessarily want to admit that to themselves. They don't want to admit that they don't have as much control over your future as they'd hope to. Um, there's just not a lot of jobs out there in academia. Um, and so in, in medieval literature, which is what I'd been studying, there are fewer, fewer jobs each year. Um, and I, knew that I could continue down that path. I knew that that was an option for myself. And I had a lot of encouragement from my direct supervisors and the faculty to do that. But the online community that I found, the people who were talking about what that life looked like, it just made me know it wasn't for me. Um, it made me feel more flexible and more empowered in my path. So uh, a semester before my grad school time ended, there was an option to join this professional writing team for the department. I was gonna be doing social media and like website stuff for my department. And I thought this, this is the job for me. <laughs> this is exactly what I wanna be doing. It's like a service job. I will, I will be able to teach a little bit. I mean, I love teaching, but this, this sounded way more fun for my last semester while I was writing. So. When I got into this job, I just feel like I lit up. I knew exactly what was going to help. I knew how to get there. I knew all the steps. Um, I enjoyed the professional development that I was cultivating around that. Um, but I wouldn't have even known where to go if I didn't have that online community. Like once I didn't know where to go, I could join a Facebook group with other social media managers in higher education. I could learn about what they're doing because they were having these conversations online. And if I had a question, they were happy to answer it. And that's what's so exciting about online community when you're in grad school. If you don't know how you're feeling, if you don't know what your next step is, if you don't know exactly what you need in life, there are places where you can go to have some of those conversations. Um, and there are also places where you can post anonymously if you're anxious about having those conversations and having it be connected with your name. I think there's lots of places online where you can cultivate community, but it's really important to understand what you need, like what's important for you and your growth right now. Um, and if you're finding that all of those community things are a little bit too much and you just wanna be with your friends on Facebook Messenger, that's totally okay too. But knowing that those options are out there is what made a difference for me. Knowing that those options were there for me to have these open conversations made a difference for the trajectory I took in life and for how I'm helping with people now. Um, I love my job, I love what I do, but I don't think I would have gotten there if I didn't have online community. That's so cool. And I would like to plug the PhD Balance Discord if you're ever looking for community and you want to be off of social media. It's completely private. You have to be added and people, um, what happens in the Discord stays in the Discord. You can also always, any time, ask for PhD Balance to post an anonymous question for you, whatever you would like. All you have to do is DM us or email us. So just just to say that out there, but that is absolutely fantastic. And I, I also am a big advocate for the online community. So I'm so glad that you were able to talk about all that and that you were able to um, benefit so much from having the online community, because that is so fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. It really made a difference for me in grad school. And I, I hope that I hope that everyone who's listening um, sees a way that it might make a little bit of a difference in their lives as well. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer, for being a guest. Um, this has been absolutely fantastic. So this has been Grad Chat by PhD Balance. Our episodes are now posted simultaneously on our podcast and YouTube channel Saturdays at 3 p.m. Eastern. You can connect to PhD Balance on our website at phdbalance.com or on social media on Twitter and Instagram at phd underscore balance. And we're also on LinkedIn at PhD Balance. Until next time, bye and take care of yourself.